One of the most fascinating periods, I think, in Jewish history is uh, a brief period of about two centuries that existed in medieval Spain. It's sometimes called the Golden Age because of the uh, phenomenal personalities that animated the cultural, especially the literary poetic life of the Iberian Peninsula uh, between about the 10th and the 12th century. Um, there's a lot of question, however, as to exactly how golden this era was. Uh, a series of books over the last decade or so have gone back and forth on this. And so I thought I'd just very quickly give you a sense of when was this golden era? Uh, why do people call it a golden era? And what are some of the criticisms to say it was not so I-I-I golden after all? Okay, I happen to have given quite a few lectures on this topic and of people in this topic. In the following lecture, I'd like to just take a very brief moment to speak about three of my favorites, actually three and a half of my favorites, uh, but I'll put in the links below some uh, uh, directions to longer videos in which I explore the lives of these people at, in a fuller length. At any rate, let's talk a little bit about the golden age of Spanish Jewry. When we last discussed the Iberian Peninsula, it was under the control of the Visigoths, who when they converted to Catholicism in the year 589, initiated a bizarre reign that was characterized by a tremendous amount of anti-Semitic legislation. As we discussed earlier, there's a lot of questions surrounding exactly the nature of how these decrees were implemented, because we really only have the legislative side to look at to try and examine the history, but it was a period of remarkable anti-Semitic legislation uh, with punishments like amputations and the imposition of a police state to track the movements of Jews, all kinds of really strange things that you wouldn't see for centuries later uh, anywhere in Europe. At any rate, it was a very, very nasty period. We have to assume between the years 589 and 711, which is when the Muslims entered the peninsula and conquered it in very short order, along with their rapid expanse across the southern part of the Mediterranean and into southern Europe as well. Uh, we don't get a lot of information about the uh, flourishing of a, you know, sort of a, a Jewish Muslim synthesis or out of this kind of cultural coexistence that will be so celebrated for the first couple hundred years. But by the time we get to the 10th century, things change dramatically. One of the concepts that comes up again and again in the origin stories of this golden age is the notion of the loyal and wise Jewish advisor, meaning you have like Muslim rulers coming into the era, military rulers, they've got to manage a, uh, a restive Christian population who resents their uh, presence, and uh, the Jews are serve as an excellent intermediary between the interlopers into the culture and the indigenous population. Um, they're uh, literate, they're numerate, they're urban. Uh, there's all kinds of you know advantages to using the Jews who themselves have no special connection to the local population, and especially not to the uh, previous regime of Visigoths, so the Jews fit that role very nicely. And over and over again, you see this phenomenon of like a, uh, a Muslim military ruler coming in and uh, needing some local support and infrastructure, and Jews are there to fill that gap. Um, it's not clear at all that, um, as some 19th century historians have argued, that Jews somehow betrayed the Iberian Peninsula to the Muslims. Uh, but it is not at all outside of the realm of possibility that when Muslims came in and as their military advance required them to go further and further north and they had to leave behind a, a thinner and thinner layer of administration, uh, the Jews were able to staff those positions to control the population, tax them, and so on. So that's probably where we have the functional origins of this interconnection. Uh, jumping ahead a little bit, of course, this uh, is reversed over the next several hundred years in something called the uh, Reconquest or Reconquista. And that refers to the Christian movement from the north down to the south, slowly pushing the Muslims back out of the peninsula. As you can see in this map here, which uh, covers the period from 914 till 1492, which is, of course, the expulsion of the Jews. 
and shortly before that, the complete conquest of the peninsula with the fall of Granada in the south. But as you can see with the color coding here, uh, gradually over the course of half a millennium, the Christians begin to slowly work their way down with significant consequences for the Jewish population, as we shall discuss a little later on in the semester. So speaking specifically about the Golden Age, what we're talking about is basically the era from Chastai ibn Shaprut to Yehuda Halevi. Those are kind of the major figures who bookend this period, and that dates from the 10th to the 12th century. The area in which this golden age is especially expressed is in the southern region, which is known as Al-Andalus, the Muslim region, and it works within a Muslim cultural ecosystem, in particular uh, the attitude to poetry and that we shall see as being so significant. Uh, I'd like to suggest, I don't think I've ever seen this term used before, but maybe I can coin it unless I'm stealing it unconsciously from someone else. Uh, there was kind of a silver age that followed it. Not nearly as amazing as the golden age, but there were a few really important figures like Nachmanides uh, or the Rashba, you know, some phenomenal figures who were in Spain shortly after the Golden Age was coming to a close, and they existed within the Christian cultural ecosystem, uh, with quite a different experience in many ways, as God willing we shall discuss as we go further along in this semester. So basically, that's what we're talking about. These 200 years between the, uh, the conquest of the peninsula in 711, it really comes to its golden period in the 10th century, uh, up until the 12th century when the Reconquista begins to slowly make its impact on this brief and fascinating period. Okay, now what makes it so golden? Perhaps one of the most significant things is something that is known in the scholarly research as la convivencia, or as I think the Spaniards would say, la convivencia, which always makes me laugh, but uh, it's it means literally the living togetherness, right? The coexistence, which is a little bit stronger, I think, in Spanish. The idea that these are, you know, uh, very uh, diametrically opposed cultures in so many ways. I mean, Christians and Muslims and Jews, they have a lot to argue about, uh, and uh, they did argue in many ways, and there was a lot of violence involved in the history between those three parties. But for some reason, uh, during those 200 years, there was a tremendous amount of a uh, a living togetherness where they appreciated each other's cultures in ways that we don't see for much of the period. There's certainly uh, several key examples of this convivencia, which is not, you know, a perfectly round convivencia with, you know, Jews and Christians and Muslims all sharing equally. It tends to be lopsided towards the Muslims in terms of political authority, for example, uh, towards the Jews in terms of fiscal activity, let's say. But, uh, and I would say the Christians are probably at the bottom end of this triangle or this circle, but nevertheless, uh, it does represent a step forward. Now, there are a lot of questions about it, though. Is it Was it really as great as uh, we will describe in the next video in particular? First of all, we should understand that one of the reasons why this happened at all is because Spain is so far away from the center of Muslim culture, which was in Baghdad, right? In fact, in many ways, the uh, the Spanish caliphate, the uh, the leaders of the Muslim society in, in Al-Andalus declared themselves a separate and independent caliphate from the, uh, the caliphate that was based in Baghdad. They were so far away. I mean, we're talking about distances that took, you know, days, weeks to travel. And so it, it was kind of like being in Vegas, and what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, there was a lot more flexibility because they were so far from central authorities, and they could act independently in many ways. That's why you see in many times a kind of relaxation of uh, Muslim orthodoxies, such as, for example, the consumption of alcohol, which was a, a very big part of the kind of evening salons that would be 
held where Muslims and Jews and Christians would get together and uh, declaim poetry and drink a lot of wine. This was something that you wouldn't see happening in Baghdad. Um, there would be some elements of this in the Ottoman Empire, but centuries and centuries later. So the the supervisory control of Orthodox uh, Islam did not have the same kind of impact on Spain as you would have in the center. There would be uh, ups and downs to this. There would be invasions from uh, the North Africa, from much more doctrinaire Muslims, who would insist on a return to some of those values. But for the, the golden era that we're talking about, there's a lot of center versus periphery issues which are very significant. And by the way, the same thing holds true for the Jews, because their center of gravity intellectually was still in Mesopotamia with the great academies of Sura and Pumbedita themselves moving to Baghdad. The Geonim were based there as well. And so they're very far away from the central authorities too. Uh, let us not forget as well that although we speak about this convivencia, uh, it wasn't completely equal. It wasn't like uh, mi casa, su casa. It was a situation where the Jews were definitely limited in their authority. Uh, there were some phenomenal figures who reached great heights but always subordinate to the Muslim rulers. There was no question that somehow there could be an independent Jewish state or anything like that. And uh, so there were similar kind of boundaries on Jews and on Christians uh, within their community. Nevertheless, placed within the larger context of what Jews and Christians were allowed to do in Muslim lands elsewhere, or what Jews or Muslims were allowed to do in Christian lands elsewhere, this was really a, a period of great liberalism and a flourishing of cultural activity. There were also moments of violence during this period. Uh, let's not think that this was one of uniform peace and uh, happiness. There was a rather remarkable pogrom in the southern region in 1066 uh, after the death of a very important figure named Shmuel Hanagid that we'll discuss, God willing, in the, the next video. Um, his son who succeeded him was unable to live up to the... Uh, expectations of the larger population, and there was literally a popular attack on him and on the Jewish community that resulted in the loss of life. This was definitely not a convivencia kind of thing to do, but it just serves to illustrate that we can't view this period entirely through rose-colored glasses. And finally, uh, one of the most striking examples, perhaps, is the flight of Maimonides. Uh, he is often considered, since he was a native of southern Spain, he's often considered one of the great exemplars of La Convivencia, but in reality, the vast majority of his uh, work, his scholarship, his activity as a Jewish leader uh, occurred in Egypt uh, as a, a, an adult and as a, an older individual. The, his period in Spain was fairly brief. His family fled uh, when he was still a young man, primarily because of Muslim persecution from those North African invasions that occurred uh, at the time. So this is just kind of like uh, caveats to the overall idea of convivencia. In the next video, we're going to look at several figures who uh, embodied the ideas of convivencia. Finally, I'd like to give you just a little bit of a historiographic perspective on the reason why we get to this whole concept of the Golden Age in the first place. A lot of it has to do not so much with the 10th through the 12th centuries, but with the 19th century, specifically Germany uh, in the middle to late 19th century. This is a period when Jews were uh, arguing quite strenuously for equal rights, for what was called emancipation, a major theme that we'll, God willing, speak about much more in next semester. Um, one of the important historians of that era was this man, Heinrich Gretz, who wrote one of the first major encyclopedic histories of the Jews uh, that has been translated incidentally into a beautiful six-volume edition at the turn of the 20th century, and it was the bar mitzvah present par excellence for decades. At any rate, um, in that context, uh, if you go to Europe in the 19th century, you see that Jews have been emancipated in France already 50 years prior in the late 18th century. They had made tremendous strides similarly in um, 
in England and even in Austria, they are, the, the tolerance patent was out and all kinds of things were indicating that Jews were getting more and more rights. Uh, Germany was not yet unified and so there was a, a patchwork approach to how Jews should be treated. Uh, and there was also that brief-lived revolution of 1848 that for a moment swept away disabilities and then it slammed them back down again. So Jews in Germany were trying very hard to make the case that they should be emancipated as well, granted equal rights, equal access to colleges and universities, equal access to professions and things like that. Uh, and one of the things that was part of their overall intellectual strategy was look at Spain from the 10th to the 12th centuries. Look at what happens when a society gives its Jews more freedom those Jews suddenly are able to make phenomenal contributions back to the society. They are able to express themselves culturally. They are expressed to, are able to express themselves in literature, uh, in science, in diplomacy, in military arts, all kinds of areas where you know Jews are this untapped human resource that are going to waste because of these uh, artificial political disabilities that are placed on them. So by sort of elevating the Spanish Golden Age and this noble Sephardic ideal, the 19th century historians really tried to create an image of uh, this perfect society as a model for 19th century Germany to follow. The historical reality uh, has a lot to say in support of that model, but as I've tried to outline here, there are some major caveats that take away from it. But at any rate, now that we have a sense of why it was considered such a uh, golden age, in the next video, let's look at three figures, three and a half really, uh, that exemplify the ideals of the period, and uh, maybe you'll see why it really was so fantastic. Thank you very much for watching.